Normal forts are the principal way in which the crust can extend. So we're going to look at the initiation of normal forts. We're going to apply this idea to the evolution of an array of forts through the domino model. And in turn, we're going to use this to look at how we can estimate the amount of stretching that happens during crustal extension. We're going to use two methods for this, so-called heave summation, and then we're going to use the rotation of fault blocks to estimate this stretching factor. So let's think about normal faults and their initiation, and we're going to apply Anderson's theory of fault initiation. So let's consider normal fault structures. And for this, the maximum compressive stress is vertical. So in order for that stress orientation to bisect the acute angle of conjugate normal faults, those faults have to dip at angles greater than 45 degrees. So normal faults must initiate with dips of greater than 45 degrees to conform to Anderson's theory. So if we look at earthquake data for the normal faults, we can see they have an array of orientations dipping anything from 30 degrees up to 70 degrees. We can interpret the steeper dips as the faults at initiation, and maybe the shallower dips down to 30 degrees represent faults as they die, so that faults are changing their dip as they develop displacement. And this notion is implicit in something called the domino model. So for the domino fault model, we say that faults are planar structures separating rigid blocks, which are the dominoes. So parallel faults separating rigid blocks and that faults both slip and the fault blocks rotate as stretching occurs like this. So that the greater the amount of stretching, the more the faults slip and the greater the rotation experienced by the blocks and the faults. Hence this notion that the earthquake data represent the evolution history of faults. The steeper faults are the faults at initiation, the gentle faults are the ones that are dying out, finishing their stretch. So we want to try and quantify the stretching of faults, and we can use two features for that. We can use the rotation history, but also we can look at the offset on the individual faults as represented by their heave. You can view domino blocks very rigidly, as in the top diagram here, which implies an abrupt change in rheology down through the lithosphere, from very brittle behaviours in the surface of the blocks, to some flowable substrate at depth. Or you could think of the rheology as changing gradually, which is a so-called soft domino model, so there's a gradual change in rheology to this more ductile behaviour at depth. In practice, there's little significant difference in the behaviour at the top of these blocks, certainly in terms of heave, as we can see here, and the rotation histories of the block tops and the faults. So we're not going to be too concerned about the deep structure of these dominoes, but we want to try and understand their behaviour from the top. So if we want to understand the dynamics of sedimentary basins, it's important to try and estimate the amount of stretching. This is the so-called heave summation method. So here we go, we have to identify the heaves from fault crest to the bottom of the fault block, from fault wall to hanging wall, for each fault, and then add each of these little fault slips together to find the total heave. So here's how this works. We're trying to find the upper crustal stretching factor, and that's simply the final length that we reserve today for a length of crust divided by its original length. So let's assume that we can make a measurement from fault block to fault block across a domain of stretched crust. That is distance L1, the modern length. And we can measure the heaves experienced by each of the faults. If we take the sum of those heaves away from the present day length from across that area of crust, then we find the original length of that crust, L0. But actually, if these fault blocks were rigid, the original length of the crust that's being stretched is simply the sum of the tops of the fault blocks here labelled P. This is the correct measurement. So if the blocks are rigid, actually the heave summation overestimates stretching because it underestimates the length of the fault blocks.
In contrast, there's an issue about whether we can actually image the heaves properly in the first place. Are we seeing all the faults? So the question we want to ask is, what is the significance of unimaged small faults? So commonly, we might want to apply a correction factor. The argument is that the image heaves underestimate the stretch. So we have two competing uncertainties here, which challenge the accuracy of heave summation as a way of estimating upper crust or stretching. We have uncertainty one on here, which we just looked at, which is the uh, possibility that we're missing small faults that would add to the heave. The, the second is that if the fault blocks are rigid, then heave summation is, in, is inaccurate for determining L0. So we need to be able to estimate the length of the tops of the fault blocks. So what else can we do? We've seen that greater stretching increases the heaves, but it also generates more rotation. So can we use the rotation history of fault blocks and the faults to estimate the stretching history? Well, this was quantified geometrically by Wernicke and Birchfield in the early 1980s. So let's look at a cartoon for this here, where we have a, a prior to slip situation. And the faults make an initial angle to bedding before faulting. And the fault crests and the top of the fault blocks gives us the original length of the strata, L0. After fault slip, this is the situation. We have a rotation of bedding, so we have a new bedding dip. Back rotated fault with a new fault dip. And a new length for these relationships from crest to crest being L1. And the L0 still there, preserved in the, in the record, is the top of the rigid block. So we have some simple angular relationships here and links that we can use trigonometrically to evaluate the stretching through these equations. So E, the elongation, simply the final length minus the original length divided by the original length. That's the E. So we can plot fault dip against bedding dip and we can make this plot and contour it up in terms of elongation here, values on the contours on the sides. We can simply report that in terms of the stretching factor beta, which is 1 plus e. So let's plot the earthquake data um, that we looked at earlier and assume that faults initiate at 70 degrees, in which case the bedding will be zero, it has yet to rotate, and then finally the faults die at 30 degrees, so the bedding has rotated to 40 degrees. What does that imply about the amount of stretching that these faults have accommodated? So the faults initiate at 70 degrees on the graph and they fall down this trajectory and they die at 30 degrees. So the beds have rotated 40 degrees. So the faults are locking up at a stretching factor of about 1.8. So that's a brief introduction to two distinct methods for evaluating upper crustal stretch, assuming the domino model, the heave summation approach and the Wernicke and Birchfield rotational method. And the question is, how can we apply those now to rift basins and continental margins on the grand scale, such as the geoseismic section at the top there? So we've looked briefly at the domino model and ways of estimating stretch through heave summation and rotation.